So the, the talk that I want to give about kidney disease is, I think, very relevant to the honoring of what Dr. King stood for, um, for a variety of reasons. And I'll, I'll just start out by pointing out some statistics and then get to something that I think a conclusion that until very lately has permeated the medical literature um, as late as 94, I believe. I mean, so many years after his work, so many years after his death, and there's still um, perpetuating misconceptions about kidney disease in African Americans that I want to really kind of drive this point home. So just to look at these statistics, um, these, the first set of bars are from the U.S. Census. There's a website now where you can get all of this information about the people that live around you. It's fabulous. About people reporting themselves as white and people reporting themselves as black in the country. And you can see that the, the people that, who report themselves to be black are a much smaller proportion than the people who report themselves to be white. However, people that start dialysis, new to dialysis in 2009, that same proportion is not there. I mean, clearly there's a difference. And then the people who are on dialysis, clearly there's a difference. Kidney disease among African Americans is, is a tremendous problem for a variety of reasons. And I, and I want to go through some of those reasons with you and then make this a very sort of person-to-person -person conversation, not faculty to faculty and staff member and operations people. Now, this is just about us being people and the fact that we work in healthcare institution aside. I want to make this very sort of people oriented. Um, the reason for this disparity that we see in uh, people reporting themselves as black being a smaller proportion than people who start dialysis and people who are on dialysis it is genetic. And I'm not going to go through these in a tremendous amount of detail. I'm going to go through them in a little bit of detail because I think that it's very interesting. But the point that I want to make is that I remember in 1994 when I was a fellow, the person I worked with was doing a compliance study in um, African Americans who got a kidney transplant because African Americans who had a kidney transplant, their kidneys didn't last as long. Well, oh, it's got to be a compliance issue. It's got to be something that they're doing turned out to be that, of course, it wasn't, that the reason for these disparities is oh so much more complicated than that rather sort of base hypothesis. And I remember in 1994, I've always been, uh, you know, I've tried to be a good girl and, you know, fight for what I believe in but not ruffle feathers when I don't have to. But I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, that's, that hypothesis is actually quite insulting in 1994 to say, oh, it must be a compliance issue, they're not taking their medicines. Uh, that I find insulting. But here are the reasons. There are at least three genetic mutations that have been discovered over the last two or three years. Wow, I mean, it is really recent. We've seen these disparities forever and a day, but it's only been recently that we've understood the science behind it. Now, some of the most, the, the one that is most famous is the, the myosin heavy chain protein 9. I'm not going to get into the details of it, although I have this fabulous yoga pose in heels, too, um, that I, when I talk about epithelial cell function at the level of the glomerulus, I'm going to spare you all that joy. But just um, point out the fact that this one particular gene, the myosin heavy chain protein 9, is a muscular protein that is vital for the function of part of the kidney. Now, there are certain genetic variants. I have to use the word mutation kind of cautiously because mutation ha implies something. Genetic variants that are associated with kidney disease. These genetic variants are present in 70% of the African American community, 7-0. This particular publication looked at European Americans, that's what, how they termed people that, that felt themselves to be white or Caucasian, and it was present in 3% of European Americans. So 70% of African Americans, 3% of European Americans. That's how disparate these genetic variants are and why certain diseases are just so intimately related to race, the predilection for race. The sickle cell mutation is a really important sort of paradigm to understand 
why the myosin heavy chain protein, and definitely why the APO, um, the APO1 mutation it could be perpetuated amongst generations and could then lead to higher frequencies of disease. Now, we all know the story about sickle cell, right? Um, if you are, live in Africa and you are exposed to malaria, if you are exposed to malaria and you have the sickle cell mutation, you are protected from mortality in certain, um, from certain strains of malaria. So you can see why that sickle cell mutation is actually probably a good thing to have when you're in an endemic area. Um, the, here are the data, and I want to thank Gina, I don't know where Jean is, for the wonderful pictures that she's added to this. She taught me that pictures say a thousand words and that sometimes text isn't so exciting. Although this text I hope you will find exciting. Um, the sickle cell trait confers a mortality benefit, particularly among the young folks in Kenya and in other places where malaria is endemic. And that is one of the reasons why some of these mutations have actually grown in frequency, but you have to understand the cost at the end of the day. So in folks who live in Kenya who have, where's my pointer, who have um, a sickle cell trait, they actually live longer than those who do not have the sickle cell trait. Of course, when you have both copies of your gene that are, have the sickle cell mutation, that is the small percentage of the population that have to pay, if you will, for the larger percentage to have that, gen that uh, mortality benefit. The APO, um, I'll go backwards, the APO A, uh, APO lipoprotein 1 mutation is also associated with kidney disease in African Americans, and the story is similar. Trypanosomal infections are endemic in certain parts of Africa. And this particular mo uh, mutation confers resistance to the trypanosomal infections. So much like sickle cell, there is a, a genetic benefit at the end of the day toward having these things when you are living in an environment where the infection is endemic. The price that you have to pay, however, is kidney disease. And that's one of the reasons why I'm super excited to talk about this. And I'm going to kind of pick up the pace a little bit, but I just wanted to sort of put in a framework um, where nephrology has come over the last 20 years, where we're finally looking to the science and understanding why these disparities really exist. So the harsh reality of kidney disease is many fold. And I, I don't really want to scare people. I want people to leave this um, discussion with the idea, oh my gosh, when was the last time I handed somebody a cup of my urine? Now for those of us that, that might have young children, you know, I, you know, we're used to peeing in the cup. But I, I really think that this is something that we need to beat everybody over the head with. There has been um, an article in The Lancet this past summer that demonstrates that the predictive ability of protein in the urine far outweighs cholesterol. So for all the cardiologists here who have spent their lives getting us to understand the link between cholesterol and outcomes and have really improved the mortality rate nationally, I applaud you. And I'm getting ready to say move over, guys, because now it's our turn to do what you did, but do it a log more. And we're going to figure out how you did it and try to do it the same way because, um, you know, everybody loves a cardiologist. I want to make everybody love a nephrologist now. So the harsh reality of kidney disease, it, it, it's pretty significant. And there are a number of reasons why I think that everyone really needs to think about kidney disease, more than just the numbers, but how that risk relates to themselves. Kidney disease, um, it, it, it takes its toll. It takes its toll in terms of morbidity and mortality. And I want to get into that a little bit, but there's some important points that I want to bring out about awareness. So many people in this room probably know what your cholesterol is. I bet you have no clue what your creatinine is. I bet you have no clue what your urine looks like with respect to protein. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that so that you get those numbers in your head and you know what to look for, you know what to ask for. The reason that I think that it's important to hit hard on that and then continue to pick up the pace even more is the fact that awareness is just absolutely abysmal in this country with respect to kidney disease. For as much as it is associated with mortality, for as much as it shortens your life tremendously, it, for some people it might be better to have pancreatic cancer than to be on dialysis. It can be that severe. 
the awareness is just absolutely abysmal. If you look at N. Haynes data, and this was published a couple of years ago, but you know, I, I just it resonates so tremendously. For those people who had varying degrees of kidney function, the degree to which the person was aware that they had kidney disease was just infinitesimally small. If you were knocking on the dialysis unit door, if you should be on the transplant list, and that would be the stage four people, less than half of them knew they had kidney disease. You know, how can that be? Every single person should be on the transplant list in this group. Every single person should have a vascular access placed or know what type of dialysis that they're going to start so that they can get rid of uh, forestall risk. Only half of them even knew that there was something wrong with their kidneys. You get down to these areas here, stage three, stage two, and stage one, and I'll, I'll, I'll provide some context as to what those different numbers mean, where you can do something, where I always say to people, and I talk a lot to ID providers because one of my great passions is uh, kidney disease in those people that have HIV. When you see this person, don't think about keeping them from the dialysis unit. Think to yourself, you're a heart attack waiting to happen because these are the folks that have the horrendous cardiovascular risk. These are the people that we are enrolling in our cardiovascular studies without really knowing you know, that, that it's, the kidney disease is a huge part of their risk. So to know about these people and jump on them and be even more vigilant about, well, why aren't you taking that med? Well, why aren't you doing this? Well, why aren't you coming? We could prevent a lot of disease. And 3% of those people knew that this was on their priority list to think about. The sad truth is that in stage two and stage three disease over here, these people are far more likely to die than they are to reach dialysis. And that's really, that's a sad truth. These people truly are heart attacks waiting to happen. And by putting, getting on their cardiovascular risk factors early, they might be lucky enough to start dialysis, i.e. live long enough. So there's a lot of very sad, um, stark facts associated with nephrology. Um, and, and these are some of them. But the nice part is, Prevention, oh my gosh, we can do so much to get rid of these risks with just some simple prevention. Over the years, has this changed? Absolutely not. You look back from the 90s to present day, you know, there's no difference. Kidney disease is just not on the public's radar screen, and that's truly unfortunate because in putting it on the public's radar screen, we can get people to pay so much more attention to the things that they're already paying attention to. And there's a lot of good that can be done in terms of prevention. So on to a little bit about what to screen, who to screen, how to screen. Your kidneys are, are back here. They really are. You, you ball up your fist about the size of your fist. They're tiny little things, and they don't have nerve endings in them. I know that somebody in this room has had a kidney stone. You know that your ureters are well innervated. I'm sure that many people in this room have had kidney infections. So you know that the membrane that surrounds your kidney is well innervated. But the kidney itself has no nerve endings in it. So you could have horrible kidney disease. I could be standing here with lupus nephritis or diabetic nephropathy and have it just raging in my kidneys and not really feel a darn thing. There's, there's really very few symptoms until the very end, and there are no nerve endings. So if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. What do the kidneys do? Well, they're the, the, the vacuums of the blood. The blood flows in, circulates, and the blood flows out. Oh my gosh, I had this, this hilarious discussion with my daughter, six years old last night, about if she pees before she goes to bed, then she will um, more likely have dry pants in the morning and you know we can become a big girl and she said oh no every time I pee I just pee more at night and we, so we have this huge discussion about how this is really just the reservoir etc she is the most knowledgeable <laughs> first grader about issues such as this but the point is is this is really just the reservoir so if you say well I you know I don't have any problems with my urine I my I pee just fine everything is cool good color good smell love it love it love it it doesn't mean <laughs> that your creatinine is not too so the point is um, you know that this is this is ha what has nerve endings in it and has nothing to do with kidney function um, if you don't look for it you don't find it but the kidney does so much more though than just 
vacuum the blood for badness. It plays a major role in anemia, in the production of red cells. It plays a major role in bone health. And what it does to help bone health has this sort of odd crossover to cardiovascular disease, to your blood vessels, that I think that we're only just beginning to really appreciate. That what your kidneys do to reach out to the bones to keep calcium and phosphorus and everything in good order, also, by, while it's, it's traversing, those hormones are traversing to the bone, affect blood vessels and result in cardiovascular calcification. So there's a lot that the kidneys do that, that reach out to organs <laughs> much further away than the bladder and more important than the bladder, although I, I love my bladder. Um, having said that, the two points that I really want to make are the number one and the number two reason that people in this country are on dialysis, are on dialysis, is diabetes and hypertension. And depending on the group that you look, like, you look at, it might be hypertension and then diabetes in the younger folks, or then diabetes and hypertension in people who are older. It varies based on age, gender, and race. Um, but if you are, are aware of what's going on with blood pressure and blood sugar, then you are doing about 95% of what you can do to make sure that if you do have kidney disease, that it won't progress or it won't progress as fast. Diabetes um, is an epidemic, not just in people who normally get diabetes, but in our younger folks too, with the outrageous incidence of obesity and type 2 diabetics in young children that we hadn't appreciated. This is going to continue to be a bigger and bigger problem, and we're starting to see a decline in the age of people starting dialysis due to type 2 diabetes. So one of the things that I want everyone to leave this room with is um, a need to reach out to your family members. So I'm sure that you've very rarely spoken to your family members about what you've seen at this conference in the past, although I know that you'd be dying to generally. Um, but this is one of those circumstances where I really would like you to. Um, don't just talk to the, the people who have had more than a few birthdays. Talk to the people who are still putting the exact number of candles that is their birthday on their cake. Because with our sedentary lifestyles, we have two Xboxes, two Wii's. I, you know, if I went down the list in my house, you know, the fact that my children make any vitamin D just boggles me. Um, our sedentary lifestyles and the plentiful nature of the foodstuffs that we have, obesity is going to be a big problem. This is going to affect cardiovascular disease in general, kidney disease right at the top of the list. So I, I like to talk. I don't like to read slides, so um, I hope you had the opportunity to look to those. High blood pressure, oh, a huge problem. High blood pressure is something that I think that this institute has fought like no other. So the concerns that I have that exist within kidney disease, you probably have lived, eat, breathed, and slept, I hope I got them all, um, over the years. Blood pressure can be difficult to control. Um, there, sometimes it requires a lot of medications. I, you know, my patients, by the time they get to me with severe hypertension, I have them on five or six blood pressure medicines. And I've seen over the years the, the same common themes. The, uh, someone, their doctor will try this medicine. Well, that didn't work, so they take them off. Then they'll try that medicine, and well, that didn't work, so they take them off. And it's not one or the other. It's a combination of many, many, many. And then, the, the understanding that bodies try to fix what you just broke. What I mean by that is if I give somebody a diuretic and make them pee more to control their blood pressure, their heart rate may go up. Well, that's the body trying to fix what I just broke because how do the kidneys know and how does the heart know that you're not having a GI bleed? They don't know that you're giving this diuretic to make the blood pressure better. So the control over time is a really an issue. And then you get into the issues of side effects. I have, it has taken me many years, but I am very good at looking a man right in the face and saying, so that blood pressure medicine that you're on, how's your sexual function? Let's talk. Hydraulics? You know, talk to me. The side effects, <laughs> Matt was my intern. I've, I've been waiting 20 years to do that. <laughs> Matt was my, <laughs> the, the side effects and the, oh, I really don't want to take that, are pretty severe. Getting to the numbers, though, 140 over 90 is our threshold to start someone on blood pressure medicine. 
kidney patients, people with kidney disease are a little bit different. So if you go to Walmart and you put your arm in the machine and it says 145 over 95, okay. You chill, it says 140 over 90. That's great if you don't have kidney disease. So if you don't know what your creatinine is and you don't know if you have protein in your urine or not, that 140 over 90 that the Walmart machine says is okay may not be good for you. 130 over 80 or below are the magic numbers for the kidneys. The kidneys are a little more sensitive um, and they want better control than average. So that's just the one point there. How is kidney disease diagnosed? Um, it's super easy. Oh my gosh. For as, as no one wants to get their blood drawn, it, it hurts. Um, and, and you have to go to a certain type of office where that's available. You have to stand in line. It is so easy to get kidney disease diagnosed. The serum creatinine is important, but even more important is the urine protein. Peeing in the cup is just so incredibly important. And if you haven't peed in the cup yearly, you haven't really gotten your physical. Um, if you only have one thing that you can do and you don't want to go and get the whole health maintenance thing, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, I understand. I got my baseline. I understand the, the, but this doesn't, there's no prep for this. Honestly, it's something we do every day, pee in the cup. Talk to your family members about peeing in the cup. The reason I'm just, uh, you know, going on about this at nauseum is because the protein, the little bit of protein that you have in your urine is far more predictive of whether you're going to be on this earth next year or in five years than is your serum cholesterol. It is far more predictive. Everyone should know if they've got a little bit of albumin in their urine right now. And if you don't, please make your appointment and get that done. Or, you know, you can buy the dipsticks on Amazon. I got lots of ways around the system. Just email me. But that's the most important thing. Glomerular filtration rate, uh, you know, nephrologists, we like to sound smart, so we come up with all kinds of phrases to make things more complicated than they are. Glomerular filtration rate is the amount of blood the kidney totally cleans in a minute. You know, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's basically it. So if you get your blood drawn and serum creatinine is something that is tough to evaluate, GFR, even, you don't even have to know what, G, what the initials stand for, but just know that it's how well my kidneys are doing, and normal is about 100 cc's per minute or 100%. So as that number goes down, it's becoming progressively less um, you know, kidney function than you were born with. We're all born with about 100%, and the lower we get, the closer we get towards zero, the closer we're getting to dialysis. Now that ties into symptoms, and again, I want to reiterate the fact that if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. That the symptoms, uh, we're born with this just beautiful redundancy of kidney function. I have got more kidney function than I could possibly ever need, which is why, you know, if my mother lives long enough to need it, and I hope she does, I will give her one of my kidneys. Because I get free babysitting. One kidney, free babysitting. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a good trade-off. When you start to get symptoms is really over here. So 100% of kidney function, stage one. Stage two, 90%. I mean, it just takes a tick downward to start to see um, increased mortality associated with kidney disease. Your mortality doesn't go up over here. Your mortality goes up right here. That's why you need to know about it. Stage three. About half of your kidney disease, or half of your kidney function is what you're left with. It's not until stage four that many people become symptomatic. And the symptoms are incredibly vague. I'll just kind of point them out to you. And what I generally hear from people is, I just don't have the energy that I used to. I'm not thinking straight. I just don't feel like myself. Uh, you know, that could be Blue Monday. It could be working 60 plus hour weeks. It could be depression. It could be family stress. And many times um, uh, that, those symptoms are equated to those sorts of things. And you don't think, let me just grab some bloods on this particular patient. Let me understand if there's something wrong because they're not terribly specific for kidney disease. Um, the heart problems we already discussed, um, and, but I just want to point out again is that when you're looking for kidney disease, you're finding kidney disease and you're treating kidney disease, of course you want to keep that person, yourself, your family member, as far away from the dialysis unit as you possibly can. But 
you want to keep them alive and as far away from the dialysis unit as possibly can. And the, the priorities are in that order, that people with kidney disease are far more likely to die than they are to progress to dialysis. My mother's creatinine was 0.9 three years ago. It's 1.3 today. Not so good for a 70-year-old woman, a creatinine of 1.3. So I've got my eye on it. But the point is, I always make the joke, God, I hope she lives long enough to start dialysis because we're going to do everything we can to keep that time period from lasting to, to be as long as possible, but I just want her to live long enough to start dialysis, not die with urine in her bladder. So what can you do? You can get screened. If you don't look for it, you don't find it. Pee in the cup. What else can you do? Good blood pressure control, good control of blood sugar, Although, um, you know, the whole di uh, issue of goal and diabetes has become somewhat complicated over recent years, I think that there's been a lot to understand exactly what goes with the excess risk associated with super tight blood sugar control. So just know that these, the, the things that you would normally do, now you'd have the motivation to do that much more. Now, um, in the last couple of minutes that I have, I just want to point out, touch base briefly on the other things that the kidneys do. Anemia, the production of red cells, is a major factor in people with kidney disease and probably contributes to a lot of the fatigue and quality of life issues that people with kidney disease have. Another very controversial area that the DCRI has been very fortunate to have to contributed to significantly in terms of bringing the real scientific facts to light. So very controversial very complicated, but it really sucks to have a hematocrit of 25%. I don't know if, if anyone has ever been that anemic, but I remember after my first child, I left the hospital with a creatinine or a hematocrit of 25%. It really sucks. So the whole is idea of making someone feel better so that they can at least enjoy their quality of life, we can do in nephrology. Bone and mineral disorders, um, just like keeping people above the fracture threshold who have osteoporosis, there are significant benefits toward diagnosing kidney disease and using that information to follow people's bone health, not just on the cardiovascular front, which I talked about a lot, but in terms of keeping people out of the hospital with their hip fracture because kidney disease is linked to bone health also. Um, and of course, the, the, all of the benefits that come with um, good nutrition, et cetera. So what happens if your kidney function starts to go south? Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the three options so that when you do bring this up at the dinner table, and I really, really hope you do, you will be then prepared to kind of understand the, the anxieties if you call your mother or your sister or your cousin about the D word. So the C word, cancer, that strikes fear in the heart of everyone, but the D word really strikes fear in the heart of everyone, dialysis. There are lots of options, and just to kind of talk about the other two, um, I think is going to be really important. We always think about hemodialysis, but what are the two types of dialysis, and, and you know, what can you expect out of lives? So when your kidney function starts to drop, you get more symptomatic at the very late stages. And when you reach a point that you cannot filter your blood on your own, we have to replace those kidneys, renal replacement therapy. Big fancy name. It just means giving someone kidney function um, through some other means. Transplants should always be at the top of the list. We don't think of it that way. Everyone should be on the list who can be before they start dialysis. It actually prolongs your life as best as we can tell using observational data. It would be lovely to transplant everyone before they even start a dialysis, or at least those people that were young and did not have significant medical problems. You can get a kidney from two different sources. One is from the deceased donor list, which we used to call the cadaveric list. I think you could probably understand why we changed the name there, because that's kind of morbid. Um, now we're the deceased donor, which is oh so much more happy. Um, that is the <laughs> traditional list. But you can also get a kidney from your family member which is why when my mother started her, her um, creatinine started going up, 
I looked at my sister and I looked at me and for a variety of reasons realized that I was going to be the, the, <laughs> the lucky weight loss person. I'm hoping my kidneys weigh about 20 pounds so that I can use it in lieu of liposuction. You can get kidneys from family members, from spouses, from friends. Um, there's a lot of very interesting literature about transplant tourism, about going to other countries and buying kidneys and how that disadvantages the people that are selling their kidneys, um, which is why here in the States, if you need a kidney, you generally um, have to prove that there is some sort of relationship between you and the donor, that you didn't just meet on the Internet and, oh, by the way, $20,000 is going to magically go from one account to the other the day after the surgery. As long as you can prove that there's a relationship there and that it's not for financial advantage, you can get a kidney from that person, providing, first, do no harm, that they are healthy enough to give the kidney, and second, that they're blood type compatible. Where is the kidney placed? There's a little pocket right here. I mean, you know, you might not be able to wear the, the bikini, the, the string bikini. You'd have to go with the one piece with the skirt. But it's worth it. If there's just a little pocket here right underneath your hip bone where that kidney is slipped. So it really doesn't disturb the silhouette all that much. And wow, does it prolong life and make lives better. So that's why we always talk about transplantation first and foremost. Now, the two types of dialysis, this is the picture that everybody sees in their head or at least knows of a little bit when you think about dialysis, but there's really two types. Peritoneal dialysis is not utilized to the same extent hemodialysis is, um, and we'll talk about both. So peritoneal dialysis here uses your body's own membranes, the membranes that are sort of wrapped around your intestines to clean the blood. If you remember back from biochemistry or if you were smart enough <laughs> to have avoided that class like the plague, things flow from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So if you put fluid inside the abdomen and that fluid doesn't have bad things in it, the bad things will flow from the capillaries that wrap around your intestine into the fluid and then you drain it out. The tube is really nice. It just goes right through the abdominal wall and it doesn't go into intestine, it just kind of sits there and you put fluid in and you take it out. I could have one right now and you'd never know. It doesn't disturb the body image that much unless I was naked and you don't have to have that mental picture. <laughs> then you'd see it, but um, it's, it's, I think, far underutilized. Now, the disadvantages are you do it yourself. You take on that responsibility. And many people are somewhat daunted by this. Um, but this is something that I think is underutilized in this country and is probably definitely has advantages over hemodialysis. So hemodialysis, I'll just get the picture up. Hemodialysis uses the kidney and that's this filter here. It's called the kidney or the dialyzer where blood flows out of, out of the, the artery using one tube, pumps, and then through the kidney. And blood flows one direction in little tubes. Dialysate bathes those tubes. And bad stuff flows from a high concentration gradient, i.e. blood, to the low concentration gradient, i.e. into the dialysis fluid or dialysate. The dialysate gets flushed away and the blood returns. So the blood is always in a, in a continuous line with the person. Um, but, of course, there are issues related to this. Um, the, the needle stick, the need for the dialysis access. There's a lot that uh, goes into hemodialysis. And this is the impression that we have of dialysis. But know that there are two other options. So I just want to end uh, this particular um, relatively short talk with the, the whole idea that we have come so long in such a short period of time but it's happened very late in understanding why the racial disparities exist within kidney disease. I really, I tried to make my comments apply to everyone, not just African Americans, but I think that in terms of a high risk population, African Americans need to understand how their kidneys work and keep an eye on this far greater than, um, to a greater extent than perhaps European Americans or Caucasian, whatever label you want to use. The reason that I say this is because particularly with that MYH9 chromosome allele problem that I mentioned, is that the risk is immediately palpable within the family. If you have one person who is on dialysis in your family, it doesn't have to be your sister, your brother, your mother, your father. It doesn't have to be a first-degree relative. It could be a cousin. 
that means that you are likely to have one of those genetic alleles present in, in your immediate family. Because if you've got somebody that lived long enough to start dialysis, and your baseline risk of having one of these alleles is 70%, 70%. You know, odds are that you probably personally contain one of those alleles that put you at high risk. So the extent to which you could add a little blood pressure down the road as you get older, a little um, diabetes down, down the road as you get older, or something else like that, that could be the second hit, could be the trigger to bring out that genetic, the genetic, uh, issue that ha was your legacy that was given to you. So understanding that and knowing that you might mean, need screening more important than the next guy is just huge, huge, huge. Um, email me, call me, I can get you set up as a person, not you know as, as a faculty member to other faculty or operations. I can get you set up with all the information that you can give to your family because I really want to make this a conversation, like I said, between people and then use you all to reach out to your family. And the one thing that I'd really like for you to do today is precisely do that. When you're at home and you're eating dinner, talk to your family. If you call your sister or your mother on the way home in the car, ask them, Have you, when was the last time you peed in the cup? Because you know, aunt so-and-so is on dialysis, which means we probably all have some sort of funky gene. Let's have family urine day or something like that. Um, you know, be outrageous today. Forget about it tomorrow. But if you talk to everybody that you're related to today, we could probably prevent at least 10 or 12 cases of end-stage renal disease amongst us and all of our contacts, all of our family, by just having this one conversation. So if you do nothing else, please just talk to the people that you love today about peeing in the cup and make sure that it's on everybody's priority list. And that's all I had to say.